And so I'm going to talk a little bit, take a shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to discuss uh, the application of precision livestock farming within the beef industry. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the use of drones within agriculture. So we have my graduate student, Gabriel, a cow-calf pair, and up on the top on the right is uh, our drone there. And so a little bit of background on what we see here in Kentucky and kind of across the southeast. Well, so Kentucky is actually the number one beef producer east of the Mississippi. And so we have about 32,000 producers with about 2.1 million head of cattle here in the state. And our average farm size which is going to be about uh, 27 head per farm, which will be drastically different from the following, the next presentation. And our rule of thumb is about uh, two acres per cow-calf pair is what general rule of thumb what we have here in the state for grazing. And then we also have a lot of producers who take their animals and background them from 600 pounds, take them up to 800 pounds and do this over the summer. And so some of our challenges within, within the state is most producers' income is primarily off the farm. And so that kind of limits our time that the producers have to monitor their cattle. So they have limited time to monitor them, they, especially during the winter months. They get home typically at 6 p.m. after the time change, and, it, and it's already pitch black dark. And so that's what my uh, figure there to the right is, trying to find an Angus cow at night. It can be very difficult. And so... You know, the average age of farmer has also been increasing steadily. So our average farmer is about 57 years of age. And so they're increasing um, in age. So we have some increase, increasing mobility issues uh, faced by our farmers. And so one of our options was we think, well, what if we use uh, drones potentially? So drones, unmanned aerial systems, so UAS or UAVs are sometimes called unmanned aerial vehicles to monitor, potentially move our cattle. So maybe if they're spatially distributed across the farm, can we use this to solve that issue? Another big challenge we have in Kentucky is gonna be mud. So this is an issue that pretty much takes place from um, pretty much November to April. And we have some months where we, and, and some February's actually gotten 10 plus inches of rain in February. So mud can be a huge issue. And, and the common saying is we're gonna get hung up with a helicopter putting out hay. And so, you know, this is obviously reducing our animals' average daily gain, kind of helps, you know, a lot of their feed intake is just going to uh, maintenance. And so there's ways we, we figured out how to, to resolve some of this. So we've had alternatives for our NRCS projects. We've, we've gone to confined feeders, we've gone feeding pads, um, and there's other ways that we've, uh, and for unconfined, we're thinking about um, utilizing um, just rotate, uh, well, bales in the field, bale grazing, essentially. And so in the winter time, we know exactly where these animals are. They're gonna be near our hay bales. This one has a, a, a feed, they're on a feeding pad, but in the summertime, they are gonna be spatially distributed across the farm. And so this is where we need something that can quickly and easily go into these different sections of the farm and monitor these animals. So one of the things we did was try to figure out, okay, if we're gonna use uh, drones or UAS on aerial systems to monitor our animals, how, how will they actually respond to them? And so we did two different trials looking at how do cattle actually respond to these drones. So we flew two different flight patterns. So one was a grid pattern. We're trying to monitor if we're doing pasture monitoring. Um, how does that, that flight path affect the animals? And what about the circular flight pattern? If we're looking at circular flight at the cow's elevation, so 25 to 30 feet above ground level, um, how does that really influence how do the animals respond? And so we had two flight characteristics. We had pre-flight and then during the flight. And so we had five minutes of flight within that pasture and then five minutes prior to flight. And we looked at our average speed was about five miles per hour when we're conducting these flights. And so we looked at the behavioral and physiological response of these cattle to the UAV and for heifers, for uh, two-year-old heifers and cows, we saw there was no change of heart when we were flying it for pasture-raised cattle at 30 feet above ground level. And I say pasture raised because they're probably maybe more so than rangeland cattle. They're getting handled a little more. They're getting uh, equipment and other aspects within their environment. So they, they might be used to a little more external stimuli within their environment. Also, you know, the bottom left hand of our corner is US 60, which seats about 17,000 vehicles per day. We have about 60 decibels uh, in the middle of the field there. And so, it, you know, we got a fair amount of just general noise taking place in that field. So with one drone flying, you know, 25, 30 feet above ground level, two different flight patterns, didn't care. There was no behavioral or physiological change. When we introduced two drones, so trying to see how the animals would respond to two drones, uh, looking at 30 feet uh, circular flight pattern. And then we had on the right there, it's kind of our, our approach style flight pattern. We're flying lower and 
and closer to the animals, you know, trying to induce movement was our right, right flight path, we saw an interesting trend. So in this case, we did see, you know, we had our circular flight pattern, two drones at one at 15, one at 30 feet above ground level. We did see an increase in heart rate. And so each one of these different colors is a, a different week. But we saw during that initial week and then, um, and in weeks two and four, when we initially input that drone into the field, uh, we saw that animals were responding, you know, with an increase in heart rate. So we saw that this is a, a fear-based response. We also saw potentially there's an increase in movement, you know, right for the first week and second week, this is for the circular flight pattern. And we kind of dissipated and went to a little more varied uh, during the last two weeks of our trial. So over the, over the four weeks, what we generally saw was, you know, that first week, you know, there is an acclimation period. You know, for both sets, both, both circular flight pattern and approach style flight pattern, there was time it took to get acclimated. For the circular pattern flights, they were able to get acclimated to it. And, you know, by, and even from a movement standpoint, yes, we saw a significant increase in movement that first week. But by week two, uh, you know, there may be moving slightly more, but it's not a fear based response. And it's because there's no change in heart rate. And so the approach style flight, that was interesting. We saw a significant change in movement all the, in movement all the weeks which is what we were expecting because we were trying to get down low and actually induce movement in these animals. However, you know, we also saw that, you know, they initially were acclimated by week two, but then they kind of relapsed on us in week three and we're seeing a change in the, a fear-based response, a change in that heart rate by week three. Then they were able to resolve themselves by week four. So we saw, saw kind of a variable response. So it depends on, and, you know, flight pattern would be important, but if we're doing direct monitoring of the animals with the circular pattern flight, you know, they don't seem to be too affected. Uh, the reason for the circular pattern flight is we wanted to also look at, you know, can we calculate the volume in, of the animal within the field? And so that's some work that we have done and, and still need to do some more on, but looked at three different altitudes and three different radiuses. And we're able to, you know, this was just with one drone and some cow statues and Brutus the bull, um, KCA bull, but uh, we had, you know, we're able to mesh and create 3D images from this. So we can calculate a volume and then we can use that to help estimate our weight of the animals. So that's, that's something we're going to do in the future is really take that volume and get it correlated to a weight estimation for these animals. And then we further validate it with this with uh, light detection and ranging. So using LIDAR, we're able to further validate this and, and drones can carry LIDAR systems as well. We had this one was a ground rig at this point, but you know, we can use LIDAR to help validate, you know, what we're measuring from the drone is actually going to be fairly accurate uh, to some of our higher resolution imaging or monitoring. So, you know, for our beef cattle uh, at the UK farm, we actually use cow manager. And so that gives us an indication of, um, and it's an actively powered tag, gives an indication of eating, ruminating, some general activity, heat, and potentially cal and calving as well. The challenge is, you know, we have to have these, you know, really between this and our router, the ear tag and the router, that distance need to be at least three to 400 feet, ideally, to get uh, adequate data transfer for the animals. And so we had these solar units are about $2,500 a pop. And so we had to have these fairly distributed across the farm. And so at some point we realized we needed me to potentially look at a better solution for this. And so what we came up with was, you know, putting this system on a drone. So being able to acquire the data from the tags, but utilizing the drone to give us more flexibility across the various fields. So instead of having one or two around waterers in certain locations, we could have this wherever the cattle are, we can fly to them, collect the data, and then and then be be able to uh, analyze it as well. So you know we added you know 63 grams for our battery, about 255 grams for our uh, unit itself, the cow manager router, and then 102 grams for the cords, put it on a phantom floor, we're able to fly and go out and acquire data um, and relatively easily across the farm. So we have to be within three to 400 feet of the cows, but then this this can get this information back to a router that's almost half a mile away. And so it's a lot, we found it to be a little more resilient of a system utilizing on the farm. Another way we've been trying to utilize a drone is trying to see how much forage is available in the field. And so we've done a couple of studies. So one we did in 2017 using a Phantom 4, looking at a field of alfalfa, this some post-processing with PIX4D. And, you know, we did some ground, ground truth to make sure whatever we're going to be visualizing it will be true and see how much of a correlation we can get between. So this would be the drone, the drone view showing here of, um, you know, can we create a surface? And it'll, it'll show here in this video, hopefully, of the alfalfa stand. 
And so then we can use that surface to help estimate how much forage is available in that field. And so from that, we can take this image, do some filtering, so remove any um, errant data, and then really get a good surface there shown on the right of our surface of our alfalfa, get a standard deviation on mean canopy height, a standard deviation on that canopy height, and then look at some other attributes, you know, going out there, uh, figuring out maturity, weed pressure, disease pressure, pest pressure, and we can develop a decent correlation for our neutral detergent fiber, our, our quality parameters, our NDF, ADF, and crude protein, and then our also get our yield. So we had a decent correlation for those aspects. We also did another flight in 2019 looking at, well, how does our camera angle uh, affect things as well? Camera angle and also changing altitude. So if we're going flying a bit higher this time, it's maybe more of a field scale resolution. And so we're able to see, you know, we can get pretty decent resolution on that entire field. And you kind of see the delineation between the pasture edge and the growing alfalfa there. <clears throat> and so for our model, we were able to show that, you know, maybe flying 164 feet above ground level with a 75 degree camera angle, the bleak angle was actually able to give us the best uh, model uh, compared to some of our other methods, methodologies that we were trying. So it gave us the best model, so it was the least amount of uh, error and the best correlation to our actual and predicted yield. And then we also, you know, think about, we've used it for looking at um, broom sage or brome sage. I'm in Kentucky, so there might be different ways of saying it. But it's, you know, it's a native warm season grass, but it's also a weed for us in this state. And so it's a lot of times it's the low, pal low palatability, low digestibility, and it's a soil fertility indicator that there's an issue a lot of times. So either having a lot of problems with our PK or our pH. And so the challenge for a lot of our producers here, and I think it's you know challenge across the board across the U.S. is just the cost of our fertilizer. And so a lot of our producers are trying to be low input management for our hay pastures and hay fields and pastures. So we did we looked at uh, a couple of different treatments for our fertilizer treatments, and you can see in the picture here there's different colors. So the, obviously the more brown it is, the more brome sage we have, the greener, the uh, more other grasses that we have here. So a lot of times in the, within the state we're trying to stockpile fescue in the fall. So this is taken in October um, and we're trying to stockpile fescue. And so one of the challenges, you know, some of those fields that have low nutrient management, that can be a challenge we see more brome sage. So this, this is a hay field that we had for over 10 years. Uh, they've been fertilized annually with 200 pounds of triple 19. And so the soil tests show that it was, you know, low, a little bit low on the pH, but especially low in our uh, potassium. And so while he'd been applying triple 19, we know that from the nutrient uptake or nutrient uptake by the plant and removal by the plant, it's going to be vastly different. So for every 3.5 tons of production, we're removing 130 pounds of nitrogen, 42 pounds of phosphorus, and 189 pounds of potassium. So we looked at a field. This is the field that we we're looking at was in Powell County. We used a standard drone with our, our um, Phantom 4 with a standard camera. And so we looked at two vegetative indices. So we looked at green leaf index and we looked at the visible atmospheric resistant index. So both of these are used um, to help evaluate the quality of our forage in the field. And, we're, and with this, you know, we're able to establish there is a difference. You know, we are able to see the difference with the drone and able to quantify the difference taking place each one of those. And so what we're able to see that as we increase, you know, our fertilizer, we are able to increase the amount of hay yields for each one of those plots, so which which makes sense. More fertilizer apply, the more yields you're going to get. But you know, one of the interesting aspects that you know by 2019, starting 2018, 2019, we're able to see a shift in the brome stage. So we we had that highest fertilizer application. We're pretty much able to eliminate the broom stage that's taking place in that field. So you know, just showing the importance of we want to eliminate that pretty much unpalatable weed in our in our fields. You know, this would this be the one way to do it. Um, and then, you know, if you have the, the constant challenge there. Another, another aspect we've evaluated somewhat for producers is that we've looked at fence line monitoring for our cattle. So in here in Kentucky, we're responsible for keep, or reliable for keeping our cattle in. It's our responsibility to keep our cattle in. And so fence line monitoring can be important. So we looked at utilizing a drone to monitor our fence line. And so compared to walking, you know, about 7,300 feet is a break even distance, you know, when, from fence line monitoring when compared to walking. Uh, our 7.5 mile per hour is approximately our break even speed. And so we can fly faster, but really, you know, just setting a parameter, setting some autonomous, relatively autonomous flight paths for these is uh, fairly simple. 
and we worked with several producers as far as setting up flight paths to help them monitor their fence line because it's our liability to keep you know, our responsibility to keep our cattle in in this state. And so think about our cost. Now think about our cost. We had a decision aid for this, you know, estimating the cost of using drone for production. If we're looking at you know just the field monitoring, you know, we think about one to two dollars. One to two dollars per acre for standard flights. Um, you know the cost of drone. I have twenty six hundred dollars here, but it can be as low as four hundred dollars for a quality drone, and you know to as much as you want to spend. So uh, this this is just another tool in the toolbox potentially. So this is just one tool in the toolbox that's available for producers to utilize on pasture. But you know for when cattle and beef cattle are, are spread across the fields, this can be fairly useful. And so this kind of just gives you just a general overview of. You know, some of the ways we think about utilizing drones uh, within our cattle operations.